Hey guys, it's Sean O'Connell, the managing editor at Cinema Blend, here with a bonus episode of Real Blend. We have Zach Krieger, who is the writer and director of Barbarian, the new horror film that's in theaters and has been generating a lot of buzz because of its wild twists and turns. Um, and Zach wanted to come on the show uh, because he wanted to discuss the film at length. And that meant spoilers. So we held our conversation until after the movie had opened and some of you guys had a chance to go see it. Now, uh, that's your warning that this conversation is going to have a lot of spoilers for Barbarian. Um, so but we really want you guys to go out and enjoy the film uh, with all of the twists, you know, still waiting for you, essentially. So if you haven't seen the film, go check out Barbarian. Come back around. Listen to Zach Kreger break down uh, this movie. But for those of you guys who have seen it and know the different directions that it goes, we had a lot to dive into uh, with Zach Kreger about filming this uh, with Justin Long and some of the things they had to do in order to set up for uh, the Detroit setting and, go and going over to Bulgaria, which has become a burgeoning sort of film community. And just how he got this unusual pitch through the studio system. Uh, I think he brings some great insight into uh, being a first time uh, horror director and, and some of the challenges that come with marketing a movie like this. And it's just a great conversation in general. Zach's a, a fan of the show. He listens to Real Blend, and so we were thrilled to get him on. So without further ado, this is Zach Greger joining Real Blend on behalf of his new horror film, Barbarian. Zach, I want to start right off the bat with an, a, a strange question, but knowing our audience, they uh, will want to know more about this. And it's about the distribution uh, and a conversation that you have as a filmmaker, because we hadn't heard much about this movie. And then all of a sudden it was like the buzz and it was deafening. And it was like, you have to see it in a theater. You have to see it before you get spoiled. But with horror, a lot of times too, there's the decision of, is it going to the theaters? Is it, is it possibly going to a streaming service? Can you give us a little bit of insight into how those conversations go? Like when the studio sees the film and how maybe they make the decision of, oh no, this has to go to theaters. I, you know, I, I'm really not a big part of these conversations. So oh, okay. I, I have a pretty limited insight into it. I know that like, um, you know, this was originally an independent film financed completely independently. And then, uh, literally like on the eve of me leaving to go to Bulgaria to shoot, like on the day of my going away party, our financier tragically passed oh, gosh. very suddenly. And so that was a Friday. And then that, that the next day, that Saturday, Roy Lee, uh, hit up Michael Schaefer at new Regency and was like, this is my favorite horror script. I need you to read it like today. And if you like it, you got to get on a zoom with the director. And if you like him, you got to, you got to give us an answer. And, and oh my God. Michael rallied the team. I got on a zoom with them that afternoon and they greenlit the movie right then and there and just sent us on our way. So by the time like a studio kind of came in, we were already up and running. And I think that if I had to guess, and, and I have no idea, I think that they were just kind of doing Roy a favor. Maybe I think they liked the script, but they're just like, I like that this movie has momentum and it's already kind of underway. So let's just help Roy. And it seems fine. And we have Bill Skarsgård and let's go for it. And then okay. when we tested it, uh, the first time we tested, it tested great. And then the second time we tested it, I know that the marketing people came in and sat in on the test. And that was <laughs> okay. what that, that's what did it. Seeing it momentum is what you said. Momentum is exactly the word, you know, because it just yeah. feels like once anyone started hearing about Barbarian, it was instantly like, oh, you got to come see this movie. You won't believe what, what's in store for you kind of thing. That's so funny. It's, I, I, I don't really feel like I have any bearing on how much people are aware of the movie or not. So it's I, I'm pleased to hear you say that. No, you, you mentioned marketing and I, 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 and again, I don't know how, again, how involved you may be in these conversations, but the trailer to what we end up seeing in the film is, is extremely different. I mean, obviously the tone of what the trailer sets up, um, but the trailer doesn't really give anything away, which is the beauty of it. It, it, it intrigues you enough to want to see it. And then it also shocks you when you sit down and see it and realize where it's really going. Um, how do you, are you involved at all on what they show in a trailer? I know that filmmakers later on, in their careers, like they might be able to, they might have final cut on those things. I'm wondering like what, what conversations you have about what you put in those trailers. So they were actually, they were very solicitous of my opinion on the trailer. And I had been working with them, uh, with the marketing team on cutting a trailer. And I've been giving all these notes and we're going back and forth. And they were very, very adaptive to my notes. And I will be the first to admit the trailer I was putting together with them wasn't great. Um, they were always <laughs> on board with not doing spoilers. That was never a fight that I had to have. Thank God. And yeah. then like, we're nearing the 11th hour and like the Joe, like the guy that I was working with, he was like, you know, I've been tinkering with something. Take a look at this. And he showed me the trailer that's out there. Like they'd just been like working on it offline without me. And it was, it was, it was fantastic. And I was like, this is it guys. You did it. Like, I'm done. Like, go ahead. I think yeah, we, yeah. We, we tweaked one little thing. Um, so I, 
it really it really was uh, kind of a, a dream experience of, of the marketing department on this. I know like there's a thousand horror stories out there of, of how these things get tanked that way, but I, I had it great. Well, and Zach, awesome. I want to mention too, that when this episode comes out, uh, it'll be post-release. And so sure. if you want to get into spoilers, we can, I, cool. I saved a couple of questions for later on, but I just it's want to hard let you know to that... talk about the movie without getting into spoilers. So 100%. I'm more than happy to do that. Let's, let's tell people now, if you haven't seen it, stop, go right. see it. Yes, exactly. it really will benefit your your viewing experience not to ruin it for yourself. That's oh, a yeah. big part of this. OK, but, uh, so to that end, I want to jump ahead to this a little bit because there are already uh, audience reaction videos of people uh, seeing mm, this, maybe in, yeah. in, in preview screenings. And I know it was in Comic-Con. Um, mm-hmm. Have you watched any of those yet? And do you maybe no. have like a, a favorite audience? <laughs> no, you haven't seen. No, them yet? no, I haven't. I haven't. I, you know what? I think all of those are on TikTok, which is the one platform I just don't spend any time on. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I refuse to have TikTok on my phone, <laughs> yeah. man. Yeah. But that's the line in the sand you're drawing. No, right there. I, don't, I have it on my phone. I just I never think about it. I try and avoid social media a lot anyway. So it's just like, yeah. oh, God, and I got to do TikTok. All right. Yeah. It's just I'm not there. I'm not there. So, Zach, I'm going to have you. I want you to tell the story because I thought this was awesome. We talked for the TV uh, press junket for this. And there's a moment where Georgina's character actually says nope in a very dis- in a very distinguished way. It's like a, it's, it's a very it's a very it's a moment that is very obvious when you see it. Um, but I talked to you about that line because in the idea that Jordan has nope out in theaters now, I know that it has nothing to do with one or the other. Um, but you told a story about going to Jordan's house to show him the movie because of that line or just to show it to him because I you guys were friends. Yeah, I didn't go to show it to him because of that line um hmm. you know he he'd been very helpful to me jordan and i are friends and he'd been very helpful to me you know before i went to bulgaria like i had he, he gave me like a big sit down dinner and kind of gave me a ton of like just invaluable advice and I, you know obviously he's someone i respect immensely and so um i I'm, I'm just thrilled to be able to pick his brain whenever i can so when i came back and i had a rough cut ready i went over and i showed it to him uh, and his wife, who, by the way, walked out in the middle of the movie because she couldn't handle it, which I was very <laughs> proud of. Um, <laughs> Has she walked out of any Jordans she, movies? We, I don't know. I didn't know. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so there's did that she say nope where, when she walked out? Or did she yeah. say nope as she nope. got up? She nope, was just nope, like, nope. I, can't, she's, I think she was like, I can't stand this and walked out of the, of the room. Um, and uh, I, she, I don't think she'll mind me saying that because she tweeted about, about that experience. Um, but uh, yeah, I asked Jordan, you know, when we were done, I was like, so does that, that there's a scene, you know, obviously where a character says, no, I hadn't seen Nope at that point. I knew what it was called. I knew he's, you know, he was in the middle of production. I was like, is this, you know, is this okay? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and yeah, I mean, he, there's not a great story here. He was just like, yeah, it's fine. I don't care. Yeah, he, yeah. he didn't mind. But I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting that line now, that word is now really kind of tied to him because it's, I mean, it, had it been a movie prior to Nope coming out, I wouldn't have even thought twice about it. You right, just think right. of characters just say that because it's, because Georgina is really smart. And that's kind of the beauty of the character that, that is in this film is that when she gets there, she's kind of knows all the horror tropes Mm -hmm. Uh, and she's like looking, it's really kind of cool to be in that POV of someone who actually understands, Oh, I'm not going in there. Nope. I'm not doing this. It's really smart. Yeah. Well, kind of the the whole driving force of the first act of the movie is, is her overanalyzing and like, and categorizing his behavior, you know, and trying to decode, like, is this guy friend or foe? So, so just, just knowing that that was the principle that everything had to kind of play against made, made the writing, uh, I, I think uh, on a lot more solid ground than otherwise. Smart. So yeah. you had written Bill's character then, um, with the air of menace, uh, and sort of distrust to the audience before even casting him, because like I think putting him in that part, is so perfect because of the horror background that he has. I completely you know, we, agree with you. We yeah. jump to the conclusion that this 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 guy's yeah. the villain. And the he has that he line opened, about a monster. Yeah. yeah, which was in the script before I cast him. And, and it's so much funnier now. I mean, the moment he opens the door, his face, everyone's like, he's bad. You know, they just they have decided, <laughs> <laughs> which is great, which is what, what you need. Um, you know, it was such a I'm a first time director. You know, this is a this is a very, very low budget movie. I never thought I would be able to get someone like Bill. He was like the first person we offered it to. But I was just like, this is a pie in the sky. We're wasting time. We should. And um, but man, we just we had a Zoom and and he you know, he doesn't even like horror movies. Here's something okay. like people don't know about Bill. He's not he's not like a horror fan so much. Um, yeah. So I don't think he was looking to do another one. Um, but but you know, I don't know. We connected. We got on. 
You know, Zach, there's a um, really interesting thing that I found fascinating watching this film. So I, I'm I'm in a, a phase right now where I'm watching a lot of older films. I'm just kind of going back and watching like older Hitchcock stuff and you know, even some earlier Brando things. But I was watching Strangers on a Train the other day, uh, which is. You I, know, oh, a it's so good. Phenomenal film. It's crazy. And the beginning shots of the two leading characters are their shoes. And it's their shoes walking towards the train. And then yeah. they then they meet by clicking yeah. the shoes. Right. Yeah. And and I started thinking about your film and I was like, OK, what are the little things that Zach's doing here that are that are telling us about the characters? And then I thought about toiletries. And I know it sounds mm -hmm. strange, but it's like part of it. I found myself really analyzing like an electric toothbrush or whatever you would show us on screen. And I'm like, what does that say about somebody about their toiletries? And I thought about pages on a train with the, with the, with the shoes. And I'm like, so can you talk about those little details and like, what do you think a toiletry says about a I, I, man? What a great question. I, I love that you paid attention and thought about that. Yes. I mean, she is a detective, you know, in this, in this scenario, she has got to be, a detective and so she's she's in the bathroom she sits on the toilet it's like these are encouraging signs that there's there is a toiletry bag on the sink and it looks right. like he's that he's plugged a toothbrush under the sink that is further evidence that this guy is an inhabitant he is a tenant you know he's here for two nights that tracks he's got little travel shampoos over there that's <laughs> prop you know that makes sense like seriously if it had been a big bottle like a like a walmart bottle of like pert plus that would be right. a bad sign you're you know right. I mean? And you yeah. gotta, you gotta think now I don't expect the audience to be with me on all of these little things, but I expect subconsciously they might be. And a lot of them, half of them, and most of the women are with me on this. They, they are yeah. tracking this. I, have I, did I talk to you about like where this kind of came from this idea? So no, but, but, but I, but I, dude, you should have seen me watching the film when, when I got into the house, like, cause you have it in the one eight five and it's such a tall ratio. I'm just mm. like, Looking around, I'm like, oh, he has a toothbrush. He's a good, I mean, maybe he is a good dude. And the, yeah. I don't know, it's a, it's a weird thing that you play with in your head. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I had this came from a book I read called The Gift of Fear by the security consultant Gavin De Becker, uh, who like lived with like Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton for a while. It was a crazy life. But there's a chapter in this book that's kind of written towards women that's encouraging them to pay attention to like the invisible little red flags that men can give off in day to day situations that will seem innocuous, but you ignore them at your peril. And he's mm. like, you have to pay attention to that little subconscious voice that is like warning you against things. And those little red flags can be very simple. It's like a man uh, touching you in a non sexual way that you didn't want mm. to initiate or doing you a favor that you didn't ask for or injecting sexuality lightly into a non sexual conversation. He's mm -hmm. like, these are like, these are potential problems. Now, guys do this all the time, but like when they're coming in rapid succession, you should pay attention. So I wanted to just write a scene, not a movie, just a scene that I could load with as many of these little red flags. So, so what does he do? You know, he makes her tea that she said she didn't want, right? He's right. bringing her luggage in. He's touching her things when she said she didn't want him to, right? He says, Tess, pretty name. It's like, that's not an appropriate thing to say mm. in this situation, you know? Right. And I right. knew that if I could just write a scene that I could load that in that, that um, there would be inherent tension and that the women that watch this movie, I hoped would feel especially like resonant with this. And they'd, and they'd be like, I've been in a situation. I know this stuff. And Zach brings up that scene. Cause I remember watching it and, and for people who have seen it, I'm assuming you've seen it by this point as you're listening they made to it this, this far, uh, but there's yeah. a moment where Bill Skarsgård literally says, do you want me to remake your tea while, while you're watching? Right. And like, I'm telling you, man, those, little small moments were like like a ping pong ball it was i was like i was i felt like sam rockwell and moon i was going back and forth like mm. playing ping pong with myself trying to figure out like is this guy good or bad it's kind of it's really smart writing really and there's is. a chance and you know that's an inappropriate thing for him to say there's a chance that he could be even worse for bringing that up he's he's like <laughs> saying out loud like you probably think i'm gonna roofie and rape you you know like that's it's like, you shouldn't even say that. You should just like let mm. her alone. And just, I don't know. It's yeah. But I also, I don't want to act like some, some super woke holier than now guy. Cause I wrote him the way I would have behaved in that situation. Mm. You sure. know, I, I'm, I would have like kind of said the wrong thing a hundred times and you know, it's, and well, try to make someone feel comfortable. You can make it worse. If you want the situation to play out the right way, you have to make him a little bit likable. You have yeah. to make it almost appear mm -hmm. that he could be doing the right thing, you know? Yeah. Otherwise you've tipped your hand completely. You know, my only, he's... 
direction to to bill was like don't be creepy like you be nice you yeah, know you okay. be you be mellow you be nice because if you lean any direction you know yeah. you're we're gonna we're gonna tip over yeah, when he yeah. says the monster line did what did, when you cut did was there a little like smirk on his face like because for people who have who are, who are listening to this there's a line where he directly says what do you think i'm some kind of monster or whatever he says something mm-hmm. like that which is obviously you think about pennywise and it but it was written before bill was cast but did he even like, did he kind of joke about that a little bit when he No, we it? never really talked about that as a, having any kind of significance or irony. It wasn't until like the first test screening when people laughed at that, but I was like, oh, I guess <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Talking a lot about um, Bill and Georgina, but I want to get into uh, not even Justin's part because I still even want to, uh, uh, you know, even though we're into spoilers, I want to protect as much of that as sure. I can. But, okay. but instead, uh, you go into a lengthy flashback uh, in, in your movie, in the storyline, uh, which introduces a, another new character, uh, which again mm-hmm. lays, gives a whole nother layer to the story that we are playing out. Right. Um, and I just want to talk to you about, like, you've already switched gears, you know, with your audience. You're already asking them to follow you in a different direction. How mm-hmm. much thought do you put into how much of this now I can show? You know, how much needs to be filled in uh, to get everybody back up to speed to where, I'm, where I kind of am in the present day? Mm, uh, mostly zero thought honestly like i tried to write this as intuitively and like just just obeying my subconscious and my own attention span as an audience member as i can so i i really wrote this as much as i could like from the david lynch kind of catching the big fish sort of a vibe okay um where i would analyze it when i was done so i was just i was just kind of following my fingers at all times really it was like the truth um so yeah that 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 just kind of came from like what would i like to see next what would be the most interesting scene to follow the one i just had i would like to see the house cleaned up back in time what's going on down there let's follow yeah. this guy it wasn't okay. it wasn't very much more than that God, it's yeah. a great shot in the trailer you oh, know thank to you. see the new house or right. newish house right that's when you start to think like oh what the is going on yeah, here. Yeah. but i think people watching the trailer will assume that that that's what the house looks like you know and, yeah, and which right. is a great thing because then when she walks out in the day and we do that sweeping shot where you kind of reveal the the carnage that will be surprising so Absolutely. i'm glad that's in the trailer and i'm glad sean brought that up because it's a perfect segue to my next question because i want to talk about aspect ratio choices because they're they're narratively driven in a way where the 185 is obviously a great tall ratio and then you have the four by three uh in that sequence that we're talking about and that's in that section of the movie that you're referring to but the lenses that you use in that in that story and especially in that one uh when he leaves the house and gets into the mm. car when we were discussing it, it's it's a, it's a relatively simple shot but at the end of the day the way the lens captures it there's a distortion and a and a brutality to the way that guy walks and the way he carries himself and the way he gets into that vehicle and um he, it's menacing and i wanted to can you talk about the different aspect ratio choices and then also the lens choices because it, there's a feeling in my gut that i got when i first saw that image of the way you were shooting that scene that made me feel really uneasy and oh. it's like, again it's a subconscious thing really it's weird um So that sequence, the flashback, I just directly lifted from this uh, 1983 Austrian film, Angst. I don't know if you've seen Angst or Mm -hmm. not. Um, Oh boy, it is hardcore. Uh, It is, it's very brutal. It's not for the squeamish, but (laughs) it's, it basically follows a a maniac uh, as he just kind of breaks into suburban homes and does terrible things, but they shoot it all almost, almost all on a snorry cam in a four, three super wide lens. And you feel, uh, terrified and hypnotized and the way it tracks this guy just kind of moves all around him as he's like doing his thing and it's very little dialogue and um i i just i I was watching angst as we were kind of prepping this movie and i was like i just i'm just gonna steal this i'm just gonna i'm just gonna do all this this is it and uh because i originally i kind of planned like we would never see his face the camera would just stay behind him and it would be like elephant um which is another big reference for me the the irish elephant as much as the gus van sant you know homage i never saw the um, irish one Oh, the Irish, it's a 40 minute made for TV documentary about the troubles. And uh, it follows, well, it doesn't follow, it, it pioneered the, the, the language that Gus Van Sant uses in his movie, where it's just long tracking shots of an assassin. Okay. Uh, he'll walk for like three minutes down a city street, walk into a deli, shoot the guy behind the deli, and then the camera will linger on the dead body for about two minutes. Oh, and he'll oh do that God. about 12 times, and then the movie's over. There's no story, yeah. there's nothing, and it's really powerful. It's crazy. Wow. 
Yeah, and so it's called the elephant because the elephant in the room is the troubles of Ireland. So Gus Van Sant reincorporated that to be like, let's talk about Columbine, let's address this. Mm. And, okay. and he used the same visual motif. But anyway, so uh, I kind of used both of those to, to spearhead what I was doing with, um, with, with Richard. Uh, I'm glad it worked. Originally, my VP and I des- wanted to do we wanted to start in 185 and then move down to 21 and then get narrow and narrow as we get under oh. the house duh, 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 until we pop out to Malibu and then we're going to go way back and open it up again. So you <laughs> feel like, what the fuck? And we, we, we couldn't, um, but we were able to, to do the four three for rich. But that lens, what was that lens you had on there? It was a 12. It's yeah. disturbing, like a really disturbing lens. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's beautiful. I, I, I would like awesome. to do more of that. And I, we use it some with Justin under the house. You know, like there's a POV where we use a Movi. Do you, have you guys had any experience with those? Explain mm. that to the audience. This is really cool. Yeah. So a Movi is like a, a device that basically you can detach the lens from the camera and you connect it via a short fiber optic cable to the mm. body of the camera. So basically you can like hold essentially like a GoPro, but it's filming in this like glorious, super, you know, I think we shot in like 9K or something. So, <laughs> so it captures like a ton of information, but you can, you, you could really put it right under Justin's chin. So when he's holding his arms out, it's a true POV where otherwise you'd have to have a, a camera. Could, you could never get it to look right. So we were able to, mm. to use that a lot. All right. So you brought up, this is your first time filmmaker, you know, and yeah. then here you're, here you're heading off to Bulgaria. You're never going to have an opportunity to have a first first day again you know as a right. director so just, right. just tell me about the night before that and oh, then man. like what you shot how you set it up how you sure. knew that like, this is gonna be my first shot it was weird okay so the night before i'm terrified you know i know <laughs> i've directed before i've directed sure. television i did i did you know five seasons of a tv show so i'm not like a total noob but yeah. that was a decade ago and the last movie that i really co-directed didn't go great so i had a lot to prove and um yeah, 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 Kevin. Uh, we we discussed that. Yes, and uh, <laughs> I had a lot to prove. And you know, it's it's scary. Like you're gonna step on set, and like part of me was like, what if I just like choke? Like what what if I lose it? What if I can't sure. do it? What if they don't like me? What if everybody like knows that I'm a fraud and I don't even know I'm a fraud? You know, oh, all you of get that your is head. with you. you get in your own totally, head. Yeah. totally. Yeah. I'm all that's going on. I'm also like, there's the other side where I'm like, no, I know this. I've been watching this movie in my mind for two years. Like I, I know exactly what I want. I've been an actor for almost 20 years. I know how to talk to actors. I'm very comfortable. So I have like kind of two warring sides. And then the first thing we filmed was the, the, what you see on the TV of the woman nursing the baby. So we brought in a woman with her newborn and we put up a blue screen and we shot it on an old VHS. Okay. And I just started talking to her and you know telling the DP like where to pan and when to zoom in. And she, everybody was like, yeah, this is all normal. Like nobody was like, this isn't right. <laughs> and, and it was the easiest thing in the world because she she'd never been in a movie so she was totally trusting me my dp and i went fine and i just realized in that moment i was like it's it's okay like everybody's yeah, yeah. I working can do this. i can do this it's totally fine yeah. and then awesome. you don't really get to linger in that anxiety because instantly a thousand questions and decisions come at you and you're just you're you're in the river you know you're going so yeah, yeah. that's probably for the best yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> you know, Zach, I, I, as I watch the film, um, I hope you don't mind me saying that. I, I feel like there are times where the camera becomes a character. Like the way you move your camera in the film is incredible. There's like a fluidity to it, like the way it's shot or the way you'll you know, zoom or you'll or you'll, or you'll pan. Or, it, there's just an interesting aspect to the way you use the camera. Um, and it never took me out of the film and actually enhanced the experience oh, uh, for me. And, and I you. wanted to but I wanted to ask about that, because when you essentially make a camera noticeable by moving it in a shot that like is obvious. Um, is there a, a, a question there of like, is this going to take the audience out or is it going to yeah. put them in it more? It's always a question. I think there's a couple that I, I, I think I got a little too flashy, the coffee cup, you know, where you kind I of love where that I moved one. down. I'm glad you like it. I, 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 you know, a lot of people have criticized that, that move the most. I, I don't know hmm. because, and I, I get the criticism. I okay, so my attitude was guys, we're shooting a Fincher movie and the on the on the top floor, and we're shooting a Raimi movie under the house. Okay. So we're not gonna get crazy until we get down. And I, that's, that's a Raimi great. move, a little too early, you know. That's the best. Um, yeah. So Oh my god, that nails it. Yeah, Dude, that, that, that's what that, everybody that was the put deal. it on the poster, man. Right, that's, right. Yeah, <laughs> movie geeks get that. Oh yeah, good. Um 
you know, and once you're making a Raimi movie and, and you're dealing with the, the claustrophobia and the extremity of what's happening, you are allowed to move that camera like crazy. <laughs> you know, you can you're do encouraged. Raising Arizona, Evil Dead yeah. 2. That's what you do. That's that's the, that's if you don't do that, you are making a mistake. Right. But up top, you know, you got to be a little more conservative because you don't want to tip your hat too early. So, yeah. That makes sense. All right. So uh, that's, I gotta, that's great. Uh, Kevin had you retell a story. Um, I'm going to have you retell a story as well, too. I don't know if you remember, but we did the screening at um, Comic-Con and then we did a quick Q&A afterwards yeah. uh, where you came out and surprised the audience and you and Justin were there. And you explained that because uh, I brought up the baby bottle uh, and right, right, the, right. Nip, the nipple poking through. And you said that at one point that scene was like more of a baby bird uh, masticating. OK, uh, so. It was an addition. Yeah. So, so originally, originally in the script, she, you know, she forces Justin to nurse, right. Or she tries yeah. to, but he refuses to latch. Uh, yes. Let's just say. And so um, in the script, she gets very frustrated and she screams in his face and then she snatches up a rat off of the, off of the ground and she bites its head off and she chews it up. She pulls him down, pries his mouth open and baby birds it into his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was so nervous to ask Justin to do this. I actually took it out of the script when I sent Justin the script because I didn't want him to pass because of that scene. And okay. then when he showed up in Bulgaria, I was like really nervous. Like, how am I going to ask this guy to like? Do he this did thing? Tusk. He'll do anything. I, well, okay, now I know. Uh, um, but as soon as I started to like kind of broach it with him, he was like, "Oh, we have to do that. We have to do that." And so he was totally down. He's he's he is the best. Um, and then we shot it, and it looked great. And Matthew really, you know dropped prosciutto into justin's mouth it was very disgusting and it, it was awesome but the problem we had to lose it because it's just you don't want to see the shark too early you know and there's no way to show that without really getting some good up close and personal oh that's fascinating you know? so, okay, that is really so it was a painful one for me that one hurt maybe on a dvd maybe maybe on yeah a DVD? yeah they, they, we put together some deleted scenes and that's in there so yeah oh good good good, good. So, okay so last time i spoke with you uh one of the things i was asking you was uh about people in your life that you're interested to see th that to see their reaction to this film and you said your mom hadn't oh. seen it yet um I, is there is <laughs> is there any update on that she hasn't no she hasn't seen it yet they're gonna go see it on friday they're going to a matinee my mom my brother my brother's wife are gonna go <laughs> see it uh and a matinee i i I don't think my brother's wife will make it through the movie. My mom <laughs> kind of has to, cause she walked out of the last time I had a movie in theater. She walked out in the middle. So like, I, and it really, you know, I gave her a hard time. So she, she really, she has to. Is um, your mom here in, in, in Virginia? Yeah. She's in Arlington. Uh, so uh, I'll uh, tell uh, you, she's going to see it at Tyson's corner at Friday <laughs> at like a two 30 or like, I going to go. Okay. I live 14 minutes from there. If I could have okay. your permission, yeah, I go, would go. love to yeah. get your mom's reaction as she walks out of that okay. theater, man. You have my permission. I would pay um, a money just to watch okay. your mom. So walk out you know what, dude? Let's That's email hysterical. after this and, and I will, I will figure this out. Cause yes, a hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> and my brother, and really you got to get my brother's wife. Cause she will have a bigger, she'll have a lot more to say than my mom. My mom will be diplomatic and she'll be like, I think Zach did a good job. And then my brother's <laughs> wife will be like, he's sick. He's sick. <laughs> Do you know the moment she's going to walk out? Can you predict the moment? Maybe Bill's death. I mean, that that scene. Yeah, is... I think maybe Bill's death. Yeah, but that's not even that. That, that that's like that's like <laughs> yeah, it 2%. gets so much worse. I know, that's a sliver. I know. Yeah, <laughs> that's a sliver. Um, yeah. Okay, so there's something I've always, I wanted to ask you since the moment I saw it, um, which is that, and this is this is full on spoiler territory, folks. If you made it this far, you've seen the movie. Well, you you've already ruined it. Yeah. The decision yeah. uh, to have Justin. I don't mean you guys. George... I mean the, the the listener. Sorry. For sure. Continue. Yeah. 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 Uh, the idea for Justin to push Georgina off the water tower. Mm. Uh, and I just need to know if there if there's an alternate version at all. Was there ever any discussion to maybe try to make him redeemable? Uh, no. Or, no. Or the, from the get go, it he, was. He has. He had to. He had to die. You know that was okay. never never not in the cards for him. Now the sequence of events was different. Originally, I wrote it um, where. He throws her and the mother runs up, grabs him by the throat and just basically squeezes his neck so tight that like his eyes pop out and he dies. And then she jumps off. But oh, okay. it, it, that doesn't make any sense. Um, she wouldn't, you know, a mother's instinct is not to get revenge and then protect the child. It's protect the child first. And then also okay. it has the added bonus of delaying his his comeuppance for the end and get one more little thing. So so, yes, I'm, I'm glad it went the way it went. 
Gotcha. You know, yeah. One thing. One thing I find interesting. It, first of all, at the end of the day, this movie is being distributed by Disney, <laughs> which, which, yeah. which, which, which is my favorite thing I've ever heard in my life. Yes. But, but cool, cool. It, it's incredible. But when the movie um, opens, we obviously see the 20th Century Studios logo, um, mm-hmm. and then it goes into the film. Um, there's still. I mean, I still don't really fully understand all the intricacies of it. But like, in terms of from your perspective, like you know, one, it being released or distributed by Disney, what that means to you. And two, um, can you tell the audience why there's still the 20th Century Studios logo there? Is, is it, 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 was it made under, I know it kind of goes into Sean's question from earlier, and you might not know all the details specifically about all the things surrounding that part of it, but how does that work? I mean, I, look, I'm such a noob and a dope with this stuff. I don't really know all the big, my understanding is that Disney acquired Fox. So Fox and New Regency are partnered. So, oh, you know, okay. New Regency has a deal with Fox where they, they you know, so they're, they're part. And so when Fox decides to release something theatrically, it's Disney marketing that comes in and, and, and does the does the stuff that I could oh. be a little wrong about that. But I think that's the gist of what's going on. One of the things that Disney does really uh, with a lot of their press is they'll do mommy bloggers. They'll bring them in for like uh, the Avengers movies. <laughs> oh, sweet I, God, please. I, yes, please. Well, I would love that. <laughs> Can somebody please solicit that for this yeah. movie? You, I would. Hey, good Could money. You know, just, just, uh, just all these mommy bloggers are like, this is a vile, vile. No, <laughs> they, maybe, maybe they connect with it. Well, yeah, maybe. Well, maybe it connect to me. Like, you know what? It, it, a mother's a, love conquers all. On a certain right level. level. That, by the way, is kind of the message of the movie. You know? <laughs> absolutely. So, sure. Yes, absolutely. Um, all right. So let's get into the mother, um, because I would love to just talk a bit about your creature design and the inspiration for it. And primarily because I expect at Halloween, uh, a couple hundred people trying to mimic the look. Uh, what do they need? Well, they'll what, get what arrested. The- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little nudity in that. <laughs> yeah, you can just walk around stark naked. Um, you know, it was, uh, there's two things. There's the, the famous painting of uh, Saturn devouring its young, you know, so I've thought about that a lot. And then there, I had a Beowulf uh, picture book as a kid, this like ink drawing of Beowulf. And there's an illustration in there of Grendel's mother who looked exactly like what you see in the movie. It was just like a very massive, tall, alabaster woman with black tangled hair in front of her and she was very powerful and it just like scared the hell out of me as a kid and so i found that i found that image online and when i went to bulgaria to to do this that i was just like make this is what we're doing let's just do this <laughs> and that's what we did so well, there you go but you keep uh, mentioning bulgaria i mean i, I, want, I want to bring this up because the movie doesn't obviously takes place in america obviously and I, right. I, what what was the choice to shoot there is is that a I know the films are shooting there, but you obviously hear about locations all the time, like people shoot in New Orleans or sure. Georgia or whatever. What is it about Bulgaria? How does that become like a hot spot for filming? Well, yeah, we were one of nine major motion pictures shooting there at the time. And this was in the thick of COVID. So there's a ton of production in Bulgaria and there's a lot of very talented crews there. So like there's an infrastructure that exists. We got linked up with it because our original financier who passed, he had made uh, a couple of movies there and he had a really good existing relationship with this oh. guy, Ivan Doikov, who was who treated me great. So he just kind of like that. That's how we, we got that all set up through our original finance here. Mm. Um, and we shot all of our interiors there. Um, we shot a lot of it there. Uh, we shot, we did shoot in Brightmoor in Detroit in the neighborhood. Oh, yeah. So we did um, our hero street though was, was constructed in Bulgaria. So we built like 13 facades and then when we flash back to the 80s, we had to be really deliberate about what we were going to see in a flashback. And we had to like, you know, retro, whatever, retrofit those houses to look appropriate. So that was kind of a to do that we never would have been able to afford in Detroit. Um, but then we went and shot there for like tests moving through the neighborhood and, and things like that downtown, that sort of thing. Um, and then we shot a day in Malibu. But but yeah, it was mostly Bulgaria. Malibu. What scene was in for Malibu? Justin driving Justin, the car? Oh, Justin the, yeah. This is when he, when he gets the when yeah. he gets the call. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. Uh, that is another situation where you know, just it's such a gut punch. Um, this guy who's you know a high, riding high on mm-hmm. on a pilot, potentially getting picked up, and you know, and the situation that falls on him is just so difficult to get into. So, yeah, um, he thinks he's in a horror movie already. Yeah, you know? yeah, um, absolutely for yeah. all the wrong reasons. Right. Um, all right, I want to get you out of here on this one, Zach, uh, okay. because people are going to come out of here uh, and wonder, you know, what else is going on in your head, <laughs> yeah. essentially, uh, and what kind of stories you want to tell next. So do you have ideas uh, where you might want to go to? There's so many. It's it's exciting now that there seem to be a lot of options for storytellers that, you know, there's there's a longer form series on on streaming. If you have an idea that can sustain that, uh, mm. there's staying in the horror realm. Do you want to go into different genres? What where are your 
So, you know, before I wrote Barbarian, I wrote a script that's actually my favorite thing I ever wrote, which is which is exists in the Batman universe. It's not a Batman movie. It's a it's a new character, but that lives in Gotham City. And it's like I'm I'm just in love with it. So one day I want to make that movie. I'm not going to be getting the keys to that car anytime soon. But like that is a big goal of mine to make that movie. All right. But I have a White as Kids uh, animated feature that is going to come out. It's called Mars. We've been self-funding that for a while and it should be done by the end of the year. And I'm really, really proud and excited of that. Um, and then I'm currently writing uh, another horror movie, which is way weirder than Barbarian. And I don't know how I'm going to crack this one, but I'm in the middle of it. And I'm writing a, a thriller that's kind of in the vein of Nightcrawler right now. Um, oh, cool. So we'll see which one of those I finish first. And then there's a science fiction script that I'm, I'm going to take out pretty soon that someone else wrote. That's just so good. I'm just like, you know, and if I don't have my two scripts ready, like I'll go try and you know, see how I see how I fare with this. Um, so there's there's things, but but uh, I don't know what's going to be next for me for certain. Well, I thought I hope that when your next thing comes out, you come back around here to our show, guys. It would on. be my sincere pleasure. Yeah. Good. Uh, well, thanks for coming on. Obviously, and uh, Kev, do you have anything else? No, I just want to say we love this film, and I, and I want to say this real quick because this is important. Like, I we see a lot of movies. I had no clue where this was going, um, yeah. and that was so freaking refreshing um it was like i i was just sitting in that theater and and the way zach it's almost like chapters the way this thing mm -hmm. kind of operates i felt um it was like there there were like two or three moments where i was like i was like holy shit this is going completely somewhere else that i had no idea it was going i had no clue this was going this way so i just want to say thank you as a film goer to have a movie that actually can take me on a ride that i'm not familiar with you know the same thing happened with jordan's nope I had no clue where that was going. I saw that four times in IMAX. And it's like, you know, I just, I love when a movie can do that to me. And it's very rare these days because everything is, everything just feels like it's some, at the same thing over and over again. So I just want to say thank you for making this movie. It was great. Well, man. Thank you for saying that, man. It means a lot. I really appreciate yeah. it. Love having you on, man. All right, guys. Thank you. This was a treat. We want to thank Zach Kreger for coming on Real Blend. Uh, it's always great to be able to get a chance to discuss a film uh, like this, especially in depth with the filmmaker to not have to um, protect ourselves from spoilers and be able to ask any sort of questions that we can get into with the ending is um, I love to hear that he uh, watches the show, listens to the show and loves being able to talk filmmaking with us. So go out and support films like this. Go out and, and support Barbarian. Uh, check it out in theaters. It's playing right now. It's super exciting. And um, and it was great to have him on the show. We'll be back soon with a full episode of. Of Real Blend, we're going to be talking about the Toronto International Film Festival, breaking down some of the announcements from D23, and essentially keeping you up to date with all of the latest movie news. So keep it right here on Cinema Blend. Hit subscribe, turn on your notifications, and whenever we drop a new Real Blend episode, you guys will be the first ones to hear about it.